Good morning, good morning, everybody. That was very nice. I appreciate that, Carly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, it's good to see everybody's smiling face out there. Smile at me now. Do it. Hey, one of the things I love about church is that uh, you guys do encourage me. And I thank you for that. I say that with all sincerity. You're like, ah, Brian, you're just the guy that's supposed to get up there. But you really do. You encourage me. One of the things I love, love, love about the week is showing up on Sunday morning. That's actually how I get people to church sometimes. I say, I like you. I like church. I like seeing you. Come hang out with me at church. I'll get to see you every week. So there you go. You can use that to get people to church right there. Um, I hope that you guys are also encouraged when you come to church, and so we're going to pray about that. Even when you're depressed, even when, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to always be happy, but this is a place that we need to lift each other up. Amen? All right, let's pray. God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you, you really are the great encourager, but I know sometimes that, that we aren't always that way. So I ask that when we come to church, when we come to this place, that we encourage one another, but first and foremost, that we lift you up as well as lifting other people up. God, you're a great God, and we want to give you the praise. Amen.
is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God?
Good morning, church. So, there are many wonderful things in this life that we give God thanks for. A few examples, standing on a beach, looking out over the ocean, be nice right now. Seeing the mountains, a starry sky on a clear night, spring, summer, fall, a little bit of winter, marriage between a husband and wife, witnessing the birth of your child, family, friendships, the list goes on and on. But the most wonderful thing in life is what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm just going to read here from 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. It says, what this means is that those who become Christians become new persons. They are not the same anymore, for the old life is gone, and new life has begun. And all this newness of life is from God, who brought us back to himself through what Christ did. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And this is the wonderful message he has given us to tell others. We are Christ's ambassadors, and God is using us to speak to you. We urge you, as though Christ himself <clears throat> were here pleading with you, be reconciled to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we may be made right with God through Christ. So that's what we remember now with communion, is his sacrifice for our sins, and ultimately him rising again, that we can live a victorious life in Christ. So let's pray right now together. Father, we bow before you again, and again, we just want to thank you for Jesus and the sacrifice he gave us on the cross and uh, to pay for our sins, Lord, and just the new life that you offer in your son, Jesus. And uh, we just can never thank you enough when we proclaim his death and resurrection until you come back, Lord Jesus. And uh, help us to be bold in our faith. May we stand in your truth and love always and help us to be a church that loves other people. And that's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Hey, Han. Hey. What's up? You okay? I'm just exhausted. Work's been so stressful. My dad is sick again. I just, I don't know. Dude, dude, she needs some encouragement. Oh, don't say that. Look, I know it's been tough, but you've been doing so well. I just don't feel that way. Let me explain. Whoa. What just happened? Anytime she's about to explain something to me, I tried to think of the quickest way to solve the problem. 
do you really think that's a good idea? Yeah, trust me, it works every time. And you are always a big part of it. All right, check it out. Your wife needs some solid advice. What does the Bible say about this kind of stuff? Well, I know that God can handle anything, and God is for us. Wait a minute, I've got it. Last week. You know, babe, God will never give you more than you can handle. Anyway, I'm gonna go meet up with the guys. Love you, bye. Thanks for the help. I did not even say that. The Bible doesn't say. And a lot of times we, we pass those around like they're just Bible, they're scriptural. Last week we looked at the one about happiness. God wants you to be happy. If you, didn't, if you weren't here last week, we have that available online. Hello, online. We have online people watching. That's pretty cool. So you can get that, that teaching. Next week, here's your uh, advertisement. Everything happens for a reason. Ever heard that? We're talking about what the Bible says about that one. But today we deal with this one. The idea is that God will never give you more than you can handle. Now, it seems so reassuring. And it seems, it seems reasonable, doesn't it? I mean, why would God give you more than you can handle? It just makes sense it would be that way. But have you ever had more than you thought you could handle? You ever had life press in and you go, I don't, I think it's, help me now. Help me now. And you ever had that where you just feel like it's too much? Maybe it's a financial load. You go, I just don't know how we're going to make it. It doesn't look possible. Maybe it was a, a bad job situation. Maybe you deal with depression. Okay, and that's a, such a load, and you just feel rotten. Uh, maybe it's relationship problems. Maybe the doctor told you, <laughs> not much we're going to do for you. And you feel, man, the load is, is just too much. I just can't take it. It's, it's more than I can handle. When that happens to you, inevitably somebody's going to come up and say, hey, don't worry. It's okay. God won't give you more than you can handle, which is basically, buck up, you're okay, quit whining, and we don't really appreciate that very much. Now, here's my question. How many of you, my first question would be about 100 of them, how many of you grew up or have believed or still believe this idea, God will not give you more than you can handle? Can I just see, come on, come on now. Okay, I, I did. I grew up thinking God will never give you more than you can handle. If you get too much, it, 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 it's not going to be that way. When I was a, the summer of 19, <clears throat> I won't give you the years, a long time back, I was a sophomore, between my sophomore and junior year of high school, I went to this Christ and Youth Conference down at uh, Southeast Oklahoma, met at a pavilion, a metal pavilion kind of thing with no sides on it, and one night we were there, right at the preaching time, there was a terrible thunderstorm that broke loose. You, I'm, I'm talking about shake, rattle, and roll, if things were moving and by the way, my old roommate from college, Les Bolt, was there. He skipped church that night, was in a tent. And God struck the tent next to him with lightning, <laughs> which that'll, that'll wake you up a little bit. Maybe I should be in church. And somebody said, and people are praying, people are crying, because it was one of those, we're going to get hit by this thing. And somebody said to me, aren't you scared? I said, no, I'm not scared at all. Here's why. Because that year, in spring of that year, my stepfather had been killed, and I reasoned, and I told people, I said, God will not give you more than you can handle. My mom couldn't handle my death along with my stepdad's death. I'm good. I felt like I could, I could, dodge a, I could go through dodging lightning bolts. Nothing could happen to me. Now, that's, that's the honest truth. That's how I felt about it. And there was something reassuring about that idea, but I'm not really sure that's what the Bible teaches. This is based on one verse of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that you've probably memorized along the way somewhere. Here it is, the New Living Translation. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow temptation to be more than you can stand. And when you're tempted, he'll show you a way out so you can endure. Now that verse says this. The promise is that not more means not sinning is always an option. When God said, I won't give you more, he's talking about temptation and not sinning is always an option. See, when you became a Christian, when you were baptized, and by the way, uh, Jesus was baptized. He told us to go baptize people. If you haven't been baptized and you want to follow Jesus, logically, hello, you're with me. But don't, get, don't misunderstand. When you're baptized in Christ, it, it doesn't mean that the devil is drowned at that time. 
Okay, he's still very much alive. In fact, when you become a Christian, the devil paints a target on your back, and temptation is going to come. I, you will not live long enough in the flesh to be where you're not tempted. I, I've talked to people in the, the last days of your life, and there's still temptation at the last days of your life. But this promise is you will not be tempted beyond your ability to stand it. So when we sin, it's because we choose to sin. It's not because the temptation was too much. But on the other hand, this promise of not more does not mean that not suffering is ever an option. Kind of wordy, but all I'm saying is, just because it says you're not going to be tempted more, doesn't mean you're not going to suffer in this life. Suffering is par for the course, and often it seems to be more than we can take. Have you seen people break under the stress? They used to call it a nervous breakdown. Okay, but it just means I had too much going on, and there was a, a mental break that happened. Mark chapter 14. I think the, the slide says Matthew, but it's actually Mark chapter 14. It says this about Jesus. He took Peter, James, and John with him. He became deeply troubled and distressed, and he told them, my soul is crushed to grief, with grief to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. He said, my, my soul is crushed even to the point of death. Jesus, I think at that point, had more than he could take. The Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse, says, verse 8 says this, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. Well, what was the problem, the problem back in Asia? And the answer is we don't know for sure, but it could be part of this in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23. Just imagine these things happening and it just seems like too much. Are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. I've worked harder. I've been put in prison more often been put in prison more often, been whipped times that number, faced death again and again. Five different times, the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Some of you were stoned, but it was a whole different thing. Just, just saying. <laughs> what was, that was, here you go. Three times shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. Oh, that's got to be great. I've traveled on many long journeys, faced danger in rivers and robbers, faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles, faced danger in the cities and in the deserts and on the seas. I faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I've worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty, often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothes to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Who's weak without my feeling the weakness? Who's led astray and I do not burn with anger? And you know what Paul's saying? It was a bunch. And he said, goes on in 2 Corinthians 1 to say this about it. We were crushed. We were overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. We thought we'd never live through it. The New American Standard translates that. We despaired even of life. Uncle, I've had enough. You know, I, I cannot take any more. You read the Psalms, you got the highs, God is great. You got the lows where David prays and he said, God, what's going on? I, I've got more than I can handle here. So here's the question of the morning. The question, why would God ever allow us to have more than we can handle? And you felt like that, haven't you? I, I've got more, I just can't take any more. I got more than I can handle. Why would God allow us to go through that? I'm going to give you three possibilities out of First and Second Corinthians. First one is this, having more than we can handle teaches us to rely on God's presence. When the trouble's too much, we look to him. Now, we're, we're Americans, so we're tough, right? We just, we just grit our teeth, we get through it. Okay, okay wait, maybe this. We're, we're men. For, for the men in the house, we're men. We're tough. We can handle it. That's how I was raised. My dad called it being mentally strong. That meant, you know, yes, they cut your arm off, put a Band-Aid on it, let's go. You're okay, quit your whining, buck up. And, and by the way, I think that's a good thing, to a degree. Better than being a wimp, don't you think? Let's, let's go, buck up. <clears throat> Here's the problem. Sometimes life is more than we can take, and being self-reliant won't work. Here's why. You were created to need God. You do need God, whether you know it or not. I, I'm telling you, this town is full of people today who slept in, who are not here. They need God. They just don't know it. 
What a shame. You need God whether you know it or not. You are designed to be reliant on God, not on you. You're, you're never going to make it on your own, and trouble reminds us of that. 2 Corinthians 1, here, we read the first part of the verse earlier. We were crushed, overwhelmed beyond ability to endure, thought we'd never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But listen, as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely on God who raises the dead. The message paraphrases that, as it turned out, it was the best thing that could have happened because we, we were forced to rely upon God. Now, we love mountaintop experiences, and we hate the valleys. And the Apostle Paul had some great mountaintops. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he said this. He said, I know a man who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven. He saw things he was not allowed. He said, I saw things in heaven I'm not allowed to bring to you. I, I would, I'd tell you, but it would blow your mind. I'm not allowed to even talk about it. And then he says this in verse 6 of that same chapter after he talks about those revelations. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so. I'd be telling the truth, but I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in me in my life or hear my message, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God. So I had those great revelations. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan, to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three times in that verse he said, I, I got a messenger from Satan, a thorn in my flesh. Why? To keep me from becoming proud. God in his sovereignty, God in his wisdom, allowed Paul to suffer physically, I think, with a thorn in the flesh so that he wouldn't run into the same problem that Satan had. Satan brought the thorn. Anybody see the magnificence of this yet? Are you getting this? Satan attacked Paul with a thorn, and God used it to keep Paul from becoming proud like Satan was proud. And he said, you know what? I'd rather, I'd rather be on the mountaintop, but if I can't be on the mountaintop with God, I'd rather be in the valley without God than on the mountaintop I'd rather be in the valley with God, help me, than on the mountaintop without him. Paul said, I, I, I've gone through rough times, but it's better this way. I've learned to rely upon him. We do better spiritually when things aren't going well for us physically. Have I said too much? I've talked to a lot of people who've come to church through the years, and almost always they come to church, they start, coming to, start seeking God because life is bad. I, my, my marriage fell apart, my job went away, somebody died, this happened, I, I, I know I need God. Okay, good. I've not had anybody so far in the years I've been preaching come to the office and say, you know what, my life is going so well. My wife loves me so much, and my, my boss gave me a big raise, and I just know I need to find God. That is not the way it works. Because when things go well, we rely upon ourselves. When the bottom drops out, we learn to rely upon God. Jonah's best prayer that ever we talked about Jonah last week going to going to preach his best prayer he ever prayed from the belly of a fish yeah it wasn't wasn't after the great revival Jonah 2 2 says this Jonah from the fish says I called out of my distress to the Lord and he answered me I didn't call out of my success I called out of distress in verse 7 as my life was slipping away I remembered the Lord and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple listen the Craig Rochelle said, the presence of a storm does not mean the absence of God. It just reminds us of how much we need him. Let me give you some promises. God said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. The Lord is close to those that call upon him. Draw near to me, he said, I'll draw near to you. And when you walk through the valley of the shadow, I'll be there with you. Isaiah 43, when you go through deep waters, I'll be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you'll not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, You'll not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. We pray, God, I, I, I want to know you more. I want to be closer to you. And please keep me safe and happy. <laughs> but often that's not the way it works. Often we draw closer to God when we're not safe and happy. We sing a little chorus and said, He's all I need. Jesus is all I need. But you don't know that until he really is all that you have as well. Someday I'm going to go to heaven. Don't know when. I'm looking forward to this ride. I said something. I'm going to go to heaven. That's, that's going to be good. I'm going to meet a lot of people. I'm going to, I'm going to meet people that I, I was in church with a long time ago. I need to apologize for the sermons I preached, but I'm going to meet those folks. Okay. I'm going to meet, I'll meet, I'll meet you there. And I'm, I'm going to get to, I can't wait to talk to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know the three boys in Daniel chapter 3? 
And I'm going to ask him, what was the highlight of your life? What was the best time of your life? When did you feel closest to God in your life? And I know the answer. They're going to say, oh, we were dancing with God in the fire. I, you see, you don't sense his presence near as much other times as you do through the rough times. And so when life seems too much, and sometimes it is too much, okay, it's more than you can handle, but you can rely upon the presence of God. He'll be with you in the storm if you go to him. Here's a second thing that happens in the storm. Having more than we can handle teaches us to experience God's power. And particularly this time, it's not just the storm, but it's when the task seems too much. You ever have a task that, that God gave you that seemed too much? When I first started preaching, uh, preaching didn't scare me at all. I was young. I was in my teens. Uh, somebody gave me a Bible, let me preach. By the way, if you're young and you're thinking about church, you either have to go to church the rest of your life and sit down and shut up, or you can get on stage and talk. It seemed like a no-brainer to me. A lot better at this than I am at that. So, but I started preaching. It didn't bother me. I wasn't scared. I'm not too scared. Not too, hey, just, just let it flow. Here I am <clears throat> several years later, 50 years later. It's an enormous task. Here's why. The Bible says this. Paul writing to Timothy, be careful. Give attention to the public reading of the Scriptures. And then he goes on to talk about that a little bit, and he says, knowing and pay attention to your life and to your doctrine to what you teach because it ensures your salvation and the salvation of those who hear you hello that's my responsibility that's too much it, it's it's actually too big a task for me ever feel that way i got too big a task anybody raising little kids and go it's too much you ever think that anybody how about teenagers raising teenagers <laughs> it's too much. How about this? Is, is there a man in the house married to a woman? I do not understand her. Is there a woman in the house married to a man and going, it's too much? I don't know how I'm going to do this. Any, anybody called to be a leader in the church? It's too much. Anybody called to lead a small group and help guide other people in their study of the Word of God? Anybody a foster parent? A lot of things going on. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. After Paul talked about that thorn in the flesh, he talks about his task a little bit, I think, when he says this. Three different times, I begged the Lord, take it away. By the way, I, if, God, if you would take away this thorn in the flesh, I could do a better job representing you. I, I would be much better without the thorn. I, I don't know if it's his eyes. I don't know if it's speech. I don't know, but if I didn't have that thorn, please take it away. And God said, my grace is all you need. My power works better, it works best in weakness. He said, you may think you're better off without it. I think you're better off with it. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses. The power of Christ can work through me. So I take pleasure in my weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Paul said, I, w I think I'd be more effective without it. And God said, no, you, trust me. My grace is enough. And Paul said, you know, my... My power is in my weakness. It's not in what I do well. Paul learned when I'm weak that I'm strong. And so when he went to preach, he says this at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I came to you to preach in weakness, timid, trembling. My message and preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever or persuasive speeches, I, only, I need, relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. You have a big job to do. Think about this. You get ready to cross a lake in a boat. You have a choice. You can row across or you can hoist the sail and wait for the, the wind to blow you across. The, the spirit, that word is the same word for wind. I can row a little bit. You ever row a little boat? I can kayak a little. You, you put me on Lake Michigan and tell me to <clears throat> like you to just row across. I can't row across that. And sometimes the job looks too big, but you hoist the sail and the spirit of God will move you to do what you need to do. I've preached a lot of Sundays when I didn't feel like preaching because I'm tough like my daddy taught me to be. <laughs> no, I, I've preached a lot of Sundays when I, I got here and I thought, I don't have much to give. You ever feel that way? I just don't have much to give anymore. But the Spirit of God often takes my weakest times and does something with it. And he does what he wants as we make ourselves available to him. I have students learning to preach. This is interesting to me, trying to teach 
people to preach a little bit at camp on a Monday night. And by the way, I've got two down, only 10 to go. I'm almost, I'm, I'll make it. I feel better about the whole idea. But the first night, I got this group of younger people, 50s, 60s, you know, I'm talking about younger people. And, but they're wanting to preach, and I, I said, you know, you can make it. You can do it. Here's why. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation, everyone that believes the Jew first and all. It's not Jew, it's the word of God. And by the way, when you speak the word of God, Acts 1.8 says, and you will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You can do it. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be steadfast, be immovable, keep working for God, knowing your toil is not in vain. I'll make something of this. You, doesn't have, you don't have to be, we're trying to teach them techniques, you know, and tell a story once in a while and keep the people interested and all those things. Those are good things. But the power is in the word of God and the spirit of God. He can work through us. A lot of people in the Bible looked at the job they were given and said, it's too much. I can't do it. Moses God said, I want you to be a spokesman. And, and Moses said, I can't speak. I, I don't have what it takes. I can't speak for God. Later on, Moses said, there's too many people. I can't, I can't lead all these people. Gideon, he's threshing grain away from where he can be seen. Normally do it outside. And he, he's away from everybody. He's, he's hiding. And the angel shows up and said, oh, mighty man of valor. You're going to lead the people of Israel. He said, man of valor? I'm a coward and... I'm, he said, I, I'm, the, I'm the weakest man from the smallest tribe, clan. I, I can't do it. And God said, you can do it. I will do it through you. Esther said, I'm scared to go talk to the king. Go do it anyway. Jeremiah said, I'm just a kid. How could I possibly speak for God? S some of you are just kids. Okay? How could I possibly speak for God? God said, I'll put my words in your mouth. It'll be okay. The apostle Paul, when called, said, you know, Called to go to the Gentiles, said, I think I'd be pretty good with Jews. I, I am a Jew. I grew up among the Jews. Let me go talk to the Jews. And God said, no, I'll send you to the Gentiles. When the task is too big, it requires his power. So rely on his presence when the trouble comes and his power for the task you have. And here's the last idea. Having more than we can handle teaches us to share God's comfort. Having come through a season of too much allows you to be empathetic and helpful to other people. In the early 80s, as a young preacher, within a period of three years, my stepbrother and my mom both died in car accidents. Now, that, that was terrible. Okay, It was terrible. It was too much. Yeah, for a young guy, it was just too much. I, I, devastating. You know what? I became just a little more empathetic because of that. You should be, you should be happy about that. I used to preach funerals before then. And I say, well, you know, he's 50 years old. I don't know what you expect. You're going to die. But after, after my mom died, my brother died, I became a little more, the, hey, these people are going through something here. It, sure, huh? I don't, know if it, I don't know if I'd have learned it as quickly any other way. And when God comforts you, you pass that comfort on to other people. Following Jesus is a team sport. Hey, I've been there. I know what it's like. And God is faithful. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, all praise to the God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and our source of all comfort. Listen, when you have too much, God will bring you the comfort you need. If you trust him, if you go to him, I'm, I'm telling you from my experience, from the people I know, if you go to him, he is faithful. He will comfort you in that time. Then he says this, verse 4, he comforts us in our troubles so we can comfort others. We have something to pass on. When they're troubled, we'll be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we were weighed down with troubles, it's for your comfort, it's for your salvation. When we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently do the same things that we suffer. You're suffering, I understand that. But when you're comforted, you pass on his comfort to the people around you. Sometimes, instead of removing the thorns like Paul had, he redeems the thorns. Think about an oyster, and it has a crack in the shell, a grain of sand gets inside, it irritates everything, and it has this secretion that makes a pearl, and there's something to share. There's a treasure in the problem. Bethany Hamilton, you know the name maybe, grew up in Hawaii, tough time, surfing by the age of three, but at age 13, a 14-foot bull shark removed one of her arms. And yet they made a movie about her. 
And she says this, I've been able to embrace more people with one arm than I ever could with two. See, her test became her testimony. I'm going to do something I know is probably going to make you a little uncomfortable. I'm okay with that. I just want to, in this room, this room is full of weakness and full of the grace of God. We've gone through storms. And we, I, I call the church the fellowship of the fine. Because on the way out, I, I'm going to say, how you doing? You're going to say, fine. <laughs> I'm fine. I, I feel okay. I, I, I got a little stuff going on, but I'm, for, for you, I'm fine. I, I, we, I know you don't want to hear about it, so I'm, I'm fine. Fact is, we're really not fine. So what I want to do, I want to ask you to raise your hand, and I'm going to leave you about eight things. If this has happened to you or somebody in your close family in the last three years, I want you to raise your hand. And I, just, just be bold. If in the last three years you are a clo- uh, if you've suffered the grief of loss in your own family or someone very close to you, would you raise your hand? Okay. Just have a look around. How about this? Anybody in the house, have you gone through the, you or someone in your close family or a very close friend, gone through the pain of divorce in the last three years? Plenty of that. How about a battle with cancer? In the last three years, family, somebody close to you? How about a battle with addiction? Sure. How about financial stress you didn't think was, you or your family, you didn't think you could get out of financial stress? Okay. Anybody had the, the joy and the agony of taking care of aging parents in the last three years? I'm glad my kids aren't here. <laughs> this is tough. Anybody with you or a very close friend or family member struggled with mental, mental illness in the last three years? One more. Anybody have a child, a grandchild, or a sibling who is, has walked away from God and is there right now? You know what? Would you, if you raise your hand one of those eight times, you'd raise your hand right now. And just have a look around. You know what? I, I probably could have done four or five of those myself. What do you do when life's more than you can handle? Because it is. It is more than you can handle <laughs> on your own. But you can go to God. He's faithful. And he'll bring you through, and you'll have a testimony to share with other people. I need the Every hour, most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Father in heaven, we do need you. And sometimes life goes pretty well, and forgive us for thinking we can do it on our own. Because I know you've made us to depend upon you, and you're dependable. Father, I pray that in this room, in this house, and among us, we could share our joys and share our sorrows, but mainly we could share the comfort that you bring to us in all those times. Father, you've given us tasks that are too big to influence children, to influence co-workers, to share the gospel, to make a difference. Father, we know you're big enough for that as well, and so we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. I have a few announcements for you. First off, a reminder about our Wednesday programming. It's every Wednesday here at the church from 5.30 to 7. This is for pre-K all the way through high school. We feed them, we play games, and they get to learn about Jesus. So please join us this Wednesday. The Junior High Strange Overnighter at Oil Belt is coming up on October 13th through the 14th. That's Columbus Day weekend. If you're interested in going now, you can still go, but now you will not get a cool t-shirt, which is fine, I guess, but you can still go to camp. So if you're interested, talk to Brian Heinrich. Also, I want to remind you, if you are a lady and you're wanting to get more involved in your Bible, please consider going to the Women's Bible Study that happens here at the church in the Foundry on Thursday mornings at 9 o'clock. The PCC Special Connections Ministry is kicking off the fall season with a second service classroom curriculum. The kids will be learning about forgiveness in the month of October, and your child will receive one-on-one teaching, learning about God and His forgiveness at their own pace. And that's all the announcements I have for you guys this Sunday, and we'll see you next week.